Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jonathan Smoke, Chief Economist of Cox Automotive. Being a, a brilliant crowd of engineers and being the only economist here to set you up for some interesting panels that follow with regards to balancing the need to invest for the future and the big disruptions facing us as well as needing to address the real challenges we have in the here and now. So what I've prepared for you is to really go through what I think are the key trends uh, that are impacting the, uh, the U.S. automotive business. And we're going to look at the here and now. Uh, we're going to look at the medium term and what's likely to happen over the next couple of years and what are the big things that are most likely to influence the direction of, of our vehicle sales and where the industry goes. But then I'm also going to tee up what are those big threats for the future, what are the changes, what are the things that are likely going to present us uh, with a, a better picture for what might drive, where we should be paying the most attention to uh, for those long-term trends as we get to the topic of mobility and mobility service, services and everything uh, that's related to that. So starting off, I want to just you know, kind of celebrate the amazing diversity that exists in the new vehicle market in the United States. This is a pie chart of all the vehicles that are sold tallied by segment. And it's, it's, a, pretty, uh, it's a testament to the diversity of the industry because we have vehicles that last year sold for an average transaction price of under $20,000 uh, to, of course, a few segments that are near or above the $100,000 uh, segment. But if you think about this and you think about how this has changed, even in just recent years, we've had, we have already gone through tremendous change. And it sets us up for questions about, well, what are the challenges? What are the opportunities? And in some cases, what are the paradoxes that we're seeing in the data? So what jumps out at you when you think about the share of vehicles sold last year was that last year, every single car sold in the United States added up was just 30% of the market. That's every luxury car, that's every subcompact car, that's every compact, midsize, uh, and full size. It all added up to just 30% of the market when sedans used to dominate the market more than 50%. And one segment, well, I'm sort of cheating with the pie chart. Technically, it's the two largest segments that, to me, define what we call crossovers, represented 33% of the market. So a single category, crossovers, was larger than all, all of the cars combined in the market. Um, so it's clearly been an enormous sea change in terms of consumer preference, but I would also argue manufacturer preference because of the money that they can make on those vehicles relative to what they used to make on just the cars alone. And then we also have this paradox that the largest growing segment, and one that captures most of the attention, we had panels all morning long, uh, in essence discussing the future of EVs or discussing that ICE is not dead yet. Uh, well, EVs last year made up 1% of the market. It is growing quickly. The paradox there is, of course, that almost all of those EVs sold were, what kind of vehicle? A sedan. <laughs> which is where all the other segments are moving away from. So it's a, it's a fascinating view of just how all of these trends are coming together and what we're selling in the here and now. But there's diversity in the United States when you think about how the market plays out county by county in the country. Uh, the map that you see is a heat map of the United States, and it's broken down by counties, color-coded by county. So the bright red spots on the map are the places that last year sold a disproportionate number of new vehicles relative to the number of people who live there. And by contrast, the other end of the spectrum, the green colors on the map are the places that had the least volume of new vehicle sales. So you can quickly see that there are certain hot spots in the country, the Northeast, Florida, Texas, California, and then a few other primarily metropolitan areas. So if you think about that, we have tremendous regional variation that occurs that influences the kind of vehicles that we're selling because there's very different people that live in those places in the country. But I'm also teeing this up to help you understand that economic cycles play out differently in different regions of the country, and that's one of the things that we need to pay attention to. Beyond just where the vehicles were sold, think about the way that we sell new vehicles. So leasing has become a very important part of the new vehicle market. 
Leasing, on average, for the last few years has been about 30% of the new vehicle retail market in the United States. In the luxury market, leasing, on average, is about 50% of the market. So you would think, all things being equal, that leasing must be pretty evenly distributed around the United States. No. This map shows you uh, the same style heat map where leasing is more likely to occur and where the penetration of leasing is actually much higher than the rest of the United States. And the answer is, it seems that everybody in Michigan leases and the rest of the northeastern United States, but other than that, it's South Florida, Southern California, and the metro areas primarily in Colorado. That means a lot of places in the country, for some reason, have not adopted leasing and that's important when you think about one of the challenges that we'll talk about today facing the industry is affordability. But that leads us to the economic view of things. How do we see sales trending across the United States? And you already see that we have tremendous regional variation. In year to date through January, which is the most current we can get in order to place where the sales occur, uh, sales occur across the country, the Rocky Mountain region and the West region were down fairly substantially and it just so happens those are the markets that are seeing economic conditions d deteriorate, especially as it relates to housing in those locations. But by contrast, the southeastern United States actually is still selling more new vehicles than they did a year ago. That part of the country is doing well and doing uh, much better with regards to the new vehicle market. And why I tee this up for you is that as we reach the end of this economic cycle that we're in, we're going to see even more variation happening in these regions around the country. So to the degree that the vehicles, the parts that you sell, the vehicles you sell uh, are of one type or another, chances are those regional variations could make you better off than the national trends or conversely could make you worse off than the national trends. But as it comes to cycle, yes, the new vehicle market is a cyclical business. Uh, the, the data going back to 1980 clearly show us that we go through a cycle of growth and a cycle of decline that happens inside of an economic expansion. So we're currently in the, in the almost longest expansion in history. When we officially get to June, we can say it's the longest in history. So like the panel that came before me, this economic expansion is not dead yet. But I guarantee you the expansion will die before the internal combustion engine dies. But that's, that's an aside. What you see in the pattern historically is that we come out of a recession and we have tremendous years of growth because we've seen a decline in sales as a result of the recession. But then as we're coming out of the recession, consumers buy more vehicles, manufacturers are excited about the opportunities. And guess what? For the most part, every factor that helps us sell more vehicles, like having lower interest rates, are better in that part of the cycle. So we overshoot what is likely to be fundamental demand. The line on that chart really represents what I think fundamental demand uh, looks like in the country. So we overshoot that for a period of years, but then it's inevitable that we start to regress back down to that line because conditions have changed. And today that biggest change is with interest rates. So the real anomaly in recent years was last year because last year we actually eked out a gain in new vehicle sales when normally we would have seen two or three years by now of, of sequential declines. But there is no question this year we'll see a decline. We've started off year to date on a pace of 16.9. We think we'll end up at a pace of about 16.8 million. And it'll be the first year in several years that we're beneath that 17 million threshold. But outside of the economic cycle, the biggest threat that I would argue is hanging over the industry literally as we speak is the threat caused from tariffs and other trade disruptions. When you think about the US market, it is very hard to define what an American car is. And we have a president that's very fixated on defining what that, uh, what that might be. But 47% of the vehicles sold in the United States last year were assembled in other countries outside of the United States. Canada and Mexico combined, but Mexico by itself is our biggest trade partner representing 15% of the vehicles that we sold here last year. The second largest partner is Japan at 10%. When you add up all of the European, uh, Asian, uh, and Mexico and Canada into the mix, it's 47% of the vehicles. But even if we focus on the 53% of the vehicles sold that are actually assembled in the United States, the average vehicle that is assembled here 
has about 40% at least of its parts content coming from other countries. So even the quote most American car or the quote most American make actually has nearly half of its components coming from other places. We've had decades of free trade that has enabled a really incredible supply chain that ensures the best components are coming from the best places in the country. So when you threaten closing borders or adding a 25% tariff to the mix, it can really disrupt what we are going to see. And the reason why I bring this up following a discussion of we eventually will have a, reci a, a recession that will lead to lower uh, vehicle sales, an impact of a 25% tariff could end up looking exactly like a recession uh, and actually lead to the, uh, to the U.S. recession. But, a lot, but that's enough of the fun and positive talk. Let's move to the thing that's really been impacting uh, the market and the declines that we've seen so far. And it's principally the impact of having higher interest rates. And in, this is the topic that I would argue as an economist has been the most interesting thing that has happened in the last three months. And let me explain to you why. Over the last, since 2015, the Federal Reserve started raising rates. And over this time, through the end of last year, they have raised short-term rates, that's what they control, uh, by 2.5%, or technically two and a quarter, uh, to the range that we're in now. And we've seen auto loan rates move almost exactly uh, in keeping with that. The, the best available rate, but also the average rates we actually see applied, and no matter what credit spectrum you are, new or used, has moved roughly 2.5% over that same time frame. And what's interesting by that is that long-term rates like auto loans and mortgages usually track long-term bonds, like the 10-year treasury. So on this chart, I'm showing you what the 10-year treasury looks like. That's the yellow line. And you can see the red line, which represents mortgages, looks just like it, in that it peaked in October of last year. And as soon as the Federal Reserve and Chairman Powell started channeling his inner guns and roses, and he discovered patience uh, in, in, with regards to rising interest rates, we've seen the bond year yield come down 70 basis points. And mortgages have come down 70 basis points. But what does that black gray line do for the auto loan rates? It has gone up slightly. How can that be? Well, it's a combination of two things. Number one is that investors in auto loans, lenders, but also the, uh, the, the trading market for asset-backed securities where auto loans are packaged and trade, uh, traded publicly, are becoming more risk averse with regards to auto loans because they're worried about delinquencies, they're worried about risk over the uh, medium term, they're basically requ requiring more premium to get them the same risk adjusted return they had just a few months ago. But at the same notion, dealers play an enormous role in lending in the United States and dealers have a certain margin that, that gets expressed in the interest rate. And I believe last year dealers were, were more willing to accept a decline in their rate in order to get a consumer in the car, but now so many things are negatively impacting them that they're having to keep the margins more consistent, and as a result, we're just not seeing improvement in, 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 in uh, interest rates available for auto loans. So the net effect is consumers are having to pay more for their vehicles, and we see that clearly in the payment inflation that has occurred. Year to date, the average new vehicle finance monthly payment is $568. That is approaching 11% of the median household's income in the United States. So put it plain and simple, we are shrinking the pool of people who can't afford to buy a new vehicle, and as a result, it inevitably leads to uh, lower sales. But if you compare what the payment trends look like for new vehicles compared to used, effectively the used market starts to become far more attractive. And the used market is something I'm going to discuss a few times today, but I hope you get the hint that to the degree that the industry can focus on it, there are many opportunities if we can think about the used market and focus on the used market. The used market is 70% of the transactions in the United States, or at least last year, and it, may be, uh, it's, it should be trending actually to a higher uh, percentage level. And it represents over the half of the value that's transacted in the United States even though most of us, especially focused on Detroit, like to focus primarily on the new vehicle market. But the used vehicle market is also different from what's being sold right here in the here and now in the new vehicle market. And these two charts contrast that. The shift that I spoke about in the pie chart where the car has been replaced by the SUV is represented on that chart. 
But then when you look to the right on the used vehicle market, which we measure by what we sell at our company, Mannheim, which represents the largest auto auctions in the country, we still see the cars dominate that. Meaning that a consumer that is looking for the most affordable car and a car priced under $20,000 is far more likely to find it in the used vehicle market instead of the new vehicle market. And that's some of the reason why the payment trends push consumers in that direction. But the new vehicle market is making that situation even worse because as we've had this shift away from cars into SUVs and at the same time we've had tremendous increases in the technology uh, being put into the vehicles, we've had this incredible shift in the price of vehicles being sold. Looking back just to 2012, so a little over six years ago, 54% of the vehicles sold in the United States had a sticker price of $30,000 or less. Today, it's barely over a third uh, are priced under $30,000, and the under $20,000 segment is almost gone entirely. By contrast, vehicles priced $50,000 and up went from 6% of the market in 2012 to this year so far almost a quarter of the market. So the industry is getting far away from the vision of Henry Ford, to put it simply, and that's part of what's leading us to this situation. So let's think about how that applies to adoption of future services and mobility. A very important metric that's going to be important for you to focus attention to over the next several years is cost per mile. And we have this tremendous range of what Americans really pay in cost per mile because it's a function of how many miles you drive, how many years ago you bought your vehicle, whether it was bought new or used, what type of vehicle you drive, where you drive, how young you are because of insurance and finance costs. But it all leads us to a scenario that young people pay more than older people pay. And it's a pretty tremendous leap. And then when you throw in the factors that young people are dealing with student loans, the highest cost of housing, and they are tending to live in the most expensive places in the country, you basically get a recipe that young people are by necessity eager to consider alternatives to transportation. And in fact, when we look at the consideration set, set across Americans, we basically see that we are seeing a rise in the, in the attitude of Americans that, yes, I know transportation is critical, but owning a vehicle is not. And it wouldn't surprise me that within the next two years that that number represents 50% of the adult population in the United States. And I believe young people will be the source of that. So today, we're going from a world that basically has 93% of the miles that, are being, uh, that people have uh, from their transportation needs are being driven in their own personal vehicle. And even though we, we can get excited about Lyft's IPO and Uber's upcoming IPO, ride hailing is 2% of that total miles traveled market. Car sharing and car subscriptions are combined are only 1%, and public transportation is 4 But what happens when we modeled, we did this... Uh, very detailed, discrete choice survey uh, with Americans last year. And we basically saw that if services were simply available in most places in the country, because when you think about it, not every place has Uber and Lyft at, at a critical mass. Not every place has subscriptions or car sharing and, uh, or other alternatives. But if we simply had access, suddenly the, via the personally owned miles would drop to 72%. And correspondingly, retail new vehicle sales would drop by 6%. This is the first leg. The second leg is when the industry figures out how to make the economics of those mobility service, services become cheaper. And what we discovered is a critical tipping point is 60 cents per mile. When an alternative to owning and driving a personal vehicle can be offered such that it's 60 cents per mile, we really see the decline in personally driven miles on owned vehicles really start to fall. And again, I believe that's consumers. So let me close on the opportunity that I think is also very interesting and it ties to the, to the US market and it ties to the downturn we're going through. Dealers in the last recession managed to stay alive not because they sold more vehicles, but because they service vehicles. When people uh, basically decide to hold on to their vehicle longer, they still have to get it serviced. In fact, I would argue they pay more attention to taking care of their vehicle. And yet we know that 70% of consumers, when they buy a vehicle, never go back to that dealer again. So it represents an enormous opportunity. 
So an opportunity for the industry as we think about the future and we think about all this impressive technology out here is to not forget the 270 million vehicles that are already in oper operation and represent an opportunity to retrofit or to upgrade the older vehicles to improve their performance and efficiency because I guarantee you dealers will be willing to consider that because of the opportunity it represents in their business. Well, I thank you for the opportunity to walk you through these uh, views of the key trends impacting the market, and I hope you're ready to grill the panel that's coming up next. Thank you.